Hey everyone, hope everyone is well. This is the uh, Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, and I'm coming to you from uh, Montreal. Uh, Georgiage, otherwise known as Georgiage, which has long been a meeting place of the various uh, First Nations. I uh, wanted to start off by uh, apologizing for what happened last week for having been uh, having the meeting sort of taken over by um, who knows who knows who in a very obviously un inappropriate uh, way. So I apologize for that. I think I've got my um, my tech down. Um, I unfortunately, I've had to mute everyone and I've had to take control over who can share a screen and stuff like that to uh, to try to protect against what happened uh, uh, last week. Um, I'm not the most uh, technologically uh, adept person. So uh, unfortunately, I should have ended that a lot earlier um, last week, <laughs> but, but I didn't uh, figure out how to do it except for just ending the whole meeting. Uh, there's an interesting question about who may have done that, like what their political motivation was. Um, I know I saw somebody online suggested it was to do with B'nai B'rith. Uh, someone else suggested it was to do with Ukraine. Uh, but I also, I think it's likely, or maybe most likely, is actually to do with Rwanda. Because the only other time I think that's actually happened is, um, is when we had um, a discussion of uh, Kagame and uh, Rwanda back in the summertime. And... Uh, and um, there was actually an effort to sort of uh, disrupt the uh, disrupt the meeting at that time. So I think it's a decent chance. Uh, no. Okay. So uh, sorry about that. Um, so yeah. So I don't I don't know exactly. I don't know who uh, who um, who did it, but I think it, it's uh, likely it's possible it's Rwanda, possibly it's Bene Brits related, possibly it's uh, Ukraine, Ukraine related. Um, so I think I thought I'd start off with uh, a um, share Rodriguez, do you hate Palestinians? Do you hate Palestinians? Canadian heritage, Canadian heritage just demanded all grantees sign the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's anti-Palestinian definition of racism, of anti-Semitism. Do you hate Palestinians, Mr. Rodriguez? In that definition, it says that claiming Israel is a racist endeavor, claiming Israel is a racist endeavor, is, is anti-Semitism. Well, Israel was born in ethnic cleansing. Israel is an apartheid state. It is a racist endeavor, Mr. Rodriguez. It's a racist endeavor for sure, Mr. Rodriguez. Do you hate Palestinians, Mr. Rodriguez? Do you hate Palestinians? Mr. Rodriguez, do you hate Palestinians? Israel, can, uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch say Israel is an apartheid state. It's an apartheid state. And you're saying we can't call it an apartheid state. You're demanding, Heritage Canada is demanding all grantees can't call it an apartheid state. Well, it is an apartheid state. Mr. Rodriguez, do you hate Palestinians? Mr. Rodriguez, do you hate Palestinians? Do you hate Palestinians? Free Palestine! Free Palestine! Uh, so that was uh, uh, on Friday. Um, there was uh, two ministers who were doing this big announcement at the Montreal train station. And um, I'll be honest with you, I'm actually uh, 
I'm very actually disappointed by the by the by the action because um it was like completely open totally exposed right like at the train station there's tons of media there and I I, I tried to get people uh from uh the Haitian community. It was a day after Trudeau announced, I'll get to that later, the day after Trudeau announced Canada was going to be sending naval vessels to Haiti. And to me, it was like the perfect opportunity for if six or seven people would have would have shown up and were uh, with a, a specific message about no Canadian military intervention in Haiti or something on those lines, would have been able to uh, probably get a fair bit of media attention and um, and uh, and actually cause quite a quite quite a difficult uh situation for them uh, because it's at the train station it's totally <clears throat> it's totally open and uh it's you can even if you're halfway down the train station and you're yelling you can you can be heard kind of all through throughout the the station anyways nonetheless i think it was good that uh rodriguez a couple of days after canadian heritage uh, announced that uh they were going to force all people who get grants which is my understanding, a large, large number of people, they're going to have to basically sign on to their anti-racism strategy to Canadian government, which includes saying that you agree to the IHRA uh, definition of anti-Semitism, which basically precludes a whole bunch of criticism of, of, uh, of apartheid uh, uh, Israel. The Maple uh, published a story a couple of days ago called Canadian officials acknowledged Israel's forced closure of Palestinian infrastructure violated rights. And based upon access to information, Alex Kosh, the editor there, showed how internally the government officials knew that uh, uh, launching airstrikes and uh, into Gaza were, were violating Palestinian rights, but never made, made any public comment. So again, just you know, sort of further confirmation if we already didn't aren't, aren't already sure about this, but they know exactly what's going on internally, and yet they don't um, they don't say anything uh, publicly and uh, enable Israel's vi uh, uh, rights violations. The the uh, I was on the Jewish National Fund of um, of Montreal's website, uh, actually their Facebook account the uh, the other day, and um, and they had a they had a a a uh, an event they're doing for uh, I think it was at a Jewish uh, school here in Montreal a JNF day. Now the Jewish National Fund is an explicitly racist organization. It's right at the heart of Zionist colonialism going back in the early 1900s, uh, basically getting the land, buying some of it from absentee property owners. <clears throat> and then getting a whole bunch of it after the ethnic cleansing of 47, 48. And, uh, and it's a registered Canadian charity. So it's, uh, it's at all kinds of like prime ministers and top officials that, that have spoke at its events over the years. And, um, and it had a Jane F day at this uh, Montreal uh, school. And in the map, I'm not sure if people can see this on, on, on my phone, but the map that they, they show is a map of, of, all of what they call Israel, of course, includes all of the West Bank, right? So they're showing, like, I think, as they said, a couple hundred kids participated in this JNF day. The map they show of Israel erases Palestinians. So this is a registered Canadian charity doing their propagandizing at a school that is in Quebec. Pri private schools are heavily subsidized by the public coffer, like half, half the money comes from public funds. Um, erasing uh, uh, Palestinians, and, and this is not a this is not a new thing. This is a this is a uh, uh, common thing that Jane has been doing in many different schools for many different uh, over many many years, and it's just one a small example of the deep seated anti Palestinian uh, outlook that circulates in Canadian political uh, uh, culture with very little comment. A couple of days ago, there was criticism. Because an Ontario uh, a second, a second, secondary school teachers uh, federation uh, teacher training, including included a discussion of the Nakba, the Palestinian catastrophe where seven seven hundred fifty thousand Palestinians were driven from their homes in forty seven and forty eight, and uh, there was a big there was a story in the in uh, I think the Toronto Sun 
uh, criticizing this, uh, and, um, and it's just it's just there's a I forget what they're called uh, um, anti-Palestinian racism a Twitter account that that uh, talked about this, and it really is it goes to just how anti-Palestinian Canadian political culture uh, is where there's a backlash when you talk about the the violence uh, perpetrated against uh, uh, Palestinians in uh, in 1948 and of course ongoing. In uh, Mint Press, there's a story titled Canadian Government Partners with Israel Lobby to Delete Pro-Palestinian Accounts. Very interesting story, very interesting article, lots of important information. I, I invite people to check it out. The maybe most interesting part of it, it, it the story is a large part about Erwin Kotler. And it basically strongly suggests that Erwin Kotler was working with Mossad, has been working with Mossad going back to the 1970s. And it, it details his, his background in the 70s, um, uh, kind of operating in the Middle East with a um, Israeli, his wife, of course, was a top uh, uh, um, staffer for uh, a big in, the Israeli prime minister in the 1970s. And, um, and it goes through some of this history, which I, I invite people to, uh, to check out. I've, I followed Kotler, of course, over the years, but I, I hadn't really um, kind of seen it argued that he was probably um, working with Israeli intelligence, though I think that makes, makes sense. David Puglesi in the Ottawa Citizen uh, published a story saying that there is $6 billion in funds set aside for weapons for the F-35. So the cost of the F-35, the first batch is $9 billion. They've already admitted the life cycle will be about $70 billion. This is on top of that. So that doesn't include, I guess, all of the top-notch weapons they expect to put on the, the F-35. And Puglesi has, has found... Um, uh, government documents suggesting it's going to reach uh, six billion. So we'll see where that all, uh, where that gets confirmed, and where that all goes. The the F thirty five. There's been with the whole balloon uh, balloon gate that we uh, talked about last week, and uh, I'm sure people are all familiar with. The there was uh, some discussion out there that the, the F thirty five would protect us from these balloons, and uh, we now know that. Um, one of the balloons, at least, appears to have been from the Northern, Il Northern Illinois Bottle Cap Balloon Brigade. And it's a balloon that you can get for between, I think, $12 and $150 or $200 or something like that. So it could have been as cheap as a $12 balloon that they, uh, they uh, sent these uh, hundred, multiple hundred million dollar fighter jets to uh, fire a $400,000 rocket to, uh, to blow out of the sky to protect us, to save us. Um, but anyway, so so there was a there was some out there kind of arguing that the balloons uh, was a we needed to get the F-35s to protect us from these balloons. And uh, but the bigger one was, of course, NORAD. And there was a whole bunch of stories all across the press, big, you know, sophisticated story commentary in the Globe and Mail about how important NORAD was uh, considering these balloons being shot down. And, and again, now it's come out that they appear to have saved us from a, a, uh, a $12 balloon. And uh, also, of course, it's come out that even the, the Chinese balloon, that they actually were monitoring it right from the get-go. And the Americans now don't believe that it was, it, 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 basically what the Chinese said, that it went off course, is, is the more real, realistic uh, 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 scenario. And... On Twitter, I, uh, uh, um, Thomas Juno, who's his former Department of National Defense uh, security analyst and a prominent, regularly quoted in the media, big Canadian University of Ottawa uh, security studies guy. I, and uh, I, I just, I pointed out what he had tweeted 10 days or a week previous about how important NORAD was in the context of these balloons, how we put more money into the military and said, you know, do you have any further comment on the uh, the uh, again the 
Northern Illinois bottle cap balloon brigade that had their balloon, <laughs> balloon $12 balloon blown from the sky. Um, but there's going to be, a, of course, as we know, holding to account of, of all these sort of militarists who jumped on this whole hyping up of the China threat to, to the use to justify NORAD spending, F-35 spending, et cetera, uh, uh, et cetera. Um, in the Globe and Mail over the past uh, three days, uh, there's been front page stories about uh, CSIS claiming that China interfered in Canada's 2021 election. So on the top of Friday's paper, it's almost the whole page at the top, no photo, it's very sort of dramatic. And then um, in today's paper, it's, it's again, it's at the top of the page. And then at the bottom of the front page is a different story uh, also about China. And it says African villages devastated by China's insatiable demand for beauty and medicinal products made from donkey skin. So uh, if it's not China interfering in our elections to undermine our democracy, it's, it's the Chinese and their beauty demands uh, 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 <laughs> impoverishing uh, Africans, according to the, uh, according to the globe. Um, and, and it's a, the, a Saturday's paper also had it on the, uh, at least a bar on the front page of, of the paper. And they're going hard at this idea that China uh, influenced the elections and basically wanted the, the, the liberals uh, to win. The, apparently the story is they didn't want, they wanted liberals with a minority government. And they definitely want they they definitely didn't want the conservatives. Um, and I, I basically believe that at the macro level that the the liberals have been uh, more reticent of joining the aggressive attack against uh, uh, China uh, 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 campaign that the U.S. empire is pushing. And I also basically believe that the Chinese government, of course, would would seek influence within Canada and it would seek influence with Canada in, in those ways in which it can influence Canada. So, so you know, I, I, Chinese community organizations, uh, you know, people with uh, Chinese Canadians, people who are, you know, regularly in China and back and forth. That all makes sense to me at some level that they would, you know, work to you know, network, uh, work with those forces, et cetera, et cetera. Now the story goes, you know, very far in this very Machiavellian plot, and and I think it wildly exaggerates the amount of power China has. Uh, and of course, as I've mentioned previously, in all these discussions of foreign interference, they always ignore the biggest interferer and who has the most power, which is of course the U.S. Um, but but the the um, yeah, the, the, you know, it makes sense to me that China would be, you know, operating at some level uh, 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 to influence, but I think it's um, uh, wildly uh, uh, exaggerated, and, and it's what ignores, what it ignores, and it's kind of remarkable how the globe does this, is it ignores that, that like, CSIS is not some sort of, like, indifferent organization. CSIS is completely tied in with the Five Eyes, with the NSA, and with the U.S. intelligence apparatus that has been pushing the Canadian government hard to get you know tough on China, and that there's an obvious self-interest that CSIS has in hyping the China threat, and and that's just like completely ignored by the Globe and Mail, and 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 it's not like the people of the Globe and Mail don't know that, and and you know the, the same guys. Uh, uh, Robert Fife and Stephen Chase, who are the main anti-China people of the globe, they're the same ones that you know a week ago, or was that two weeks ago now? Maybe they had a whole series of stories about how the the um, um, that the the um, the research Canadian researchers with Chinese uh, government uh, with Chinese researchers that had some connection to the Chinese military. And then all of their all their info came from this this uh, this American CIA a private like intelligence group, 
right? So all this stuff about Canadian academics having cut ties to Amer to Chinese academics who have ties to Chinese military world, it all it all comes from a, an organization that that's you know the, the former CIA guys are all at top, and it's you know explicitly uh, and that's just ignored in the Golden Mail piece. So they don't they just they don't even mention that. Uh, and just like they don't even mention, they don't, you know, quote anybody. I mean, CSIS has a long history of hyping threats, hyping, uh, you know, Islamic terrorist threats, targeting Canadian Muslims as it fit into the war on terror and aligning with the U.S. empire and the war on terror. This isn't new. I mean, if you go backwards and why CSIS was even created is because the RCMP was was like blowing up a, 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 was a cottage or, or a ranch uh to basically blame it on the um, the sovereigntist movement in Quebec, and and that's the that's like the roots of 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 the creation of of, of CSIS, uh, dividing it from the RCMP. So, like these intelligence agencies aren't just some like you know independent organizations that are just trying to get to the truth. They are politicized uh, organizations, and uh, and the Globe Mail, of course, knows that, but they they don't. Um, bother to tell their readers because they're not they're 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 in a campaign against China they're not they're not in a a um a sort of uh uh you know truth seeking uh endeavor and and again they I've, I've said this before the the idea of setting up a foreign registry for a foreign agents registry in Canada is a good idea we should have a, a registry for for foreign agents and i think that people should groups should should document when they're getting funds from from other countries and, and I think what you'd find is that the U.S. and Israel would be, right, the U.S. would be far and away the top, and, and Israel would be, uh, would be there. China would probably be on the list as well, and probably find the Saudis and uh, some, other, uh, some other countries that are also uh, uh, engaged in, in, in this activity. And it, I think it should be, uh, certainly should be, uh, if not curtailed, it should at a minimum be uh, 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 quantified and uh, made uh, public about exactly where money's coming from and stuff like that. Shifting gears to uh, to Haiti, the Trudeau, of course, went down to uh, the Bahamas to participate in the CARICOM Caribbean Community uh, Conference on uh, Wednesday and uh, Thursday, I believe. And beforehand, he talked about uh, Haiti with John Kerry, the climate the climate uh, envoy for uh, the Biden administration, which I found that kind of interesting, kind of weird. Uh, Anita Anand talked about Haiti with Lloyd Austin, all over a whole bunch of conversations that Trudeau's had with different figures around the world in recent days, again, about Haiti. And, and clearly the conference was, and Trudeau, Trudeau participating in the conference, and, and to a large extent taking over the Car Caribbean Community Conference, was was to push the Carib Caricom countries to dispatch forces, be that military, be that police, to Haiti, and so the, Trudeau is trying to prod them. And if I, on Twitter I saw some pe person post about the uh, the Nassau paper, the Bahamas paper, and they have it like you know front page is all about Trudeau being there and pushing Haiti. So so you, you just see the political impact internally within. Uh, Caribbean country on the issue and Trudeau's visit, you know, uh, putting that onto the agenda and forcing that on. And um, so that's clearly part of it. It's also clearly partly to uh, please Washington. So you got this interesting dynamic where it's Washington pushing Ottawa to lead a mission and Ottawa pushing the CARICOM countries to uh, uh, participate in that mission. Apparently Washington's also been pressing Brazil on the matter. The the uh, Trudeau met with Ariel Henry when he was in Haiti, the uh, unelected, unconstitutional, uh, unpopular uh, foreign appointed uh, leader of Haiti. And he announced that there would be two Canadian naval vessels that were going to be dispatched to Haiti. Again, I think this is about prodding the Caribbean countries to say that Canada is taking it seriously. It's also to signal to Washington that Canada is taking it seriously. Now, um, the whole question of the CARICOM. I, I think I've brought it up in, in a month ago or uh, previously. It, it, this, this is really interesting because it, it, it plays off. It is two things going on here. One is how involved in Haiti Canada is and how much Canada really is the secondary force in Haiti and so influential in so many aspects of Haitian political life. 
But the other part, and how, you know, that the prime minister, you know, the prime minister flying down, flying, calling everyone, Haiti, Haiti, Haiti. Um, uh, but the second part to it all is the Caribbean, the, the former British colonies in the Caribbean element to it. And we see how um, Canada has influence and Canada has these historic ties to the, to the Caribbean. And, you know, Canada has a military base in Jamaica, right? Jamaica has said it's, it's willing to send troops to Haiti. A, Canada has been training the Jamaican military security forces long, long, decades, decades, influential training in Jamaica. Uh, I've talked about the banking power that goes back, you know, more than a century, the, the bank laws, most of the bank laws in the Caribbean, it was the former governor of the Bank of Canada that wrote those, the post-independence banking legislation in those countries. And um, as Alain Deneau pointed out in his book about the, uh, the um, Caribbean um, offshore uh, uh, havens, tax havens, they, the, the banking laws were all written in ways that were really good to uh, the foreign banks and to you know, all this uh, not paying taxes and, 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 and the like. Um, so there's a whole history of Canadian power in the, uh, in the former British colonies that Trudeau is playing off of while he, push, while he goes down to the CARICOM uh, uh, conference. Um, but at the conference, they announced two Canadian naval vessels will be dispatched to Haiti, apparently to fight gangs. That's the ostensible reason. It's a little bit unclear how that's going to work, if it's just going to be providing intelligence to the Haitian police. There doesn't seem to be much gang activity that's actually on water uh, in Port-au-Prince or, or, or anywhere in the country, but there may be a little bit, so theoretically they could actually in some way disrupt uh, that, but that seems uh, hard to, to, to uh, believe. Um, so, you know, I don't know what it's about exactly. I mean, I think that it's about prodding the CARICOM countries, and I think it's about uh, pleasing Washington, uh, but tangibly, it also, I think, does provide some further support or legitimacy to Ariel Henry, so it, it reinforces the, the High Transition Council, this initiative that Canada has back that basically continues Ariolani's rule, but provides a little bit more of a veneer of, of, uh, of uh, uh, civil society acceptance um, of, his, of his unelected rule. Uh, I, I published an article that looked at the history. So Canada has a whole history of gunboat diplomacy in Haiti. You go, go back, you know, pre-Canada, pre-Confederation with dispatching all of the uh, vessels and the Halifax base to uh to fight the the haitian uh uh revolt in 1793 to fight against haitian revolution then you got in the uh a couple examples in the 1860s uh, the 1860s and 1880s of uh british vessels dispatched to the caribbean there were dozens and dozens of british french german american uh, naval vessels dispatched to haiti from like 1850 to 1915 to basically intimidate Haitian uh, political leaders to usually to pay debts to their banks or, or other capitalist interests. And so a couple of vessels from uh, Halifax uh, were part of those uh, efforts in the 1800s. Uh, going up to more recently, 1963 example, where Canadian naval vessel with, with uh, British and American vessels uh, were, were Duvalier, Francois Duvalier, is coming to the end of his first term very unstable. There was a concern that there were guerrilla groups that were uh, uh, Cuba-oriented. This is not long after the Cuban Revolution, that uh, Cuba-oriented guerrilla groups might, might take advantage of, of the instability in Haiti. And so naval vessels from Canada, US, Britain were, were dispatched um, in the 1980s, 93, many examples. Most, most recently after the earthquake in 2010, two Canadian naval vessels that didn't have really anything to help people who were hurt by earthquakes, but had a couple thousand Canadian troops to try to make sure that, uh, that uh, Jean-Bertrand Aristide, who was then in exile, wouldn't, uh, wouldn't return to, uh, to the country amidst a, uh, a political vacuum. So, so there's a history of Canadian gunboat diplomacy in Haiti that people don't know. There's a much more uh, fascinating history of Canadian gunboat diplomacy throughout the Caribbean, the English Caribbean, actually, the former British colonies. And there's a, a quite interesting book of 2000 called the uh, Canadian gunboat diplomacy, and it's written from like military people. It's not, not you know, from an anti-imperialist perspective. It's written from like pro-military people, 
and they show just how many times Canada's dispatched um, uh, uh, naval vessels to the Caribbean. One instance is very fascinating. One is to Jamaica and the plans in the 1970s and again in the 80s. Basically, if there was a nationalist government or socialist government that that um, that uh, nationalized uh, Alcan's bauxite interests in in uh, in Jamaica, the Canadian military had a plan to to dispatch naval vessels to uh, seize the seize the operations, and they actually um, is all uh, uh, the internal government documents. So there's a long history of Canadian gunboat diplomacy in in the hemisphere. Now, uh, <clears throat> shifting gears, the I, I posted to Twitter uh, a statement that um, got a fair bit of mostly positive reaction, a little bit of negative reaction. I, I think it's uh, kind of an interesting um, a theme that I do want to talk about a little bit. And I said it on Twitter, I said, quote, with Ottawa promoting Haiti intervention, supporting Palestinian dispossession, contributing to NATO proxy war, backing Peru coup, promoting conflict with China, assisting rights abusing mining firms, etc. It's incredible many who call themselves leftists ignore Canadian foreign policy. And it is, it really is genuinely amazing that if all the uh, injustices that Canadian foreign policy is promoting around the world, and in the context of, of uh, incredible inequality in our world, where Canada is at the top of the hierarchy in, uh, in global uh, uh, capitalist uh, uh, relations and wealth and, and, and whatnot. And the inequality in our world is just so vast. And Canadian foreign policy is, is in large part designed to uh, maintain and reinforce that inequity, that there are people on the left who, who, who consider themselves very active. And I, and I, I got going on this by, by going through the Twitter account of, of an activist, somebody I knew uh, years ago and who was actually involved in anti-war activism uh, years ago and just went through his Twitter and there's nothing about nothing about came foreign policy, nothing really about the rest of the world. And, and, it, and it's actually quite common. And somebody, but most people, you know, were sympathetic to what I had said, but somebody on my Twitter uh, responded by saying, I'm sorry, Eve, but, but folks on Twitter that, but complaining that folks on Twitter that came leftists are failing for not being involved in their favorite issues. Does this mean we should ignore racism, sexism, ableism, the rise of fascism, grinding poverty at home, all because they don't fit your perspective? Now, the that response I thought was quite illustrative. Uh, it, 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 in some ways, to be honest, it was kind of like what I, what I was kind of playing on. And uh, Yuri, who's a good friend of uh, the Canadian Foreign Policy Hour, he immediately tweeted, uh, kind of pushed what I said in that direction of, you know, they, we get people who challenge these issues get called a tanky and by other leftists. And, and, um, and I think he, you know, that was where, that was kind of the direction I was going. So I understand why, you know, somebody would be offended by what I wrote. But I find it really amazing because, you know, as someone who spends almost all of my overt political energy on foreign policy issues, the reality is, is I've been to way more, well, certainly more, probably way more demonstrations that have to do with refugee rights, tuition, uh, uh, indigenous rights, labor rights, sexism, uh, BLM, Whatever I've you know I've been hundreds and hundreds of demos on domestic issues, and and I think that that's the case with most people who focus most of their overt political energy on on international issues. They in fact go they in fact have gone they go actually go to more, you know, domestic related mobilizations or whatever uh, because there are so many more of those taking place, and and. So it's like you can ignore the foreign policy issues, but you can't actually ignore that even if you, again, even if most of your, your attention, overt political energy is on the foreign policy issues, you can't really ignore, and you don't. Very few, almost no one does ignore the, uh, the uh, uh, domestic issues. But here, here you had somebody who, if you go on their Twitter, they call themselves an anarchist and 
eco anarchist, very like you know postury kind of Twitter handle, like criticizing uh, me for pointing out that there are leftists who don't pay attention to foreign policy issues, which this person, of course, was one of those people. And that gets me to a discussion of the uh, rage against the war machine uh, demonstration that took place in uh, in uh, in uh, Washington D.C. and a few other cities in the U.S. Uh, yesterday. From what I could tell, um, it seemed like it was a not a big success, but not a failure. Like I, I've seen numbers of a thousand, three thousand, kind of floating floating around out there, which is you know small by historic, you know, anti-war mobilization kind of uh, perspective. But I certainly didn't believe there was going to be, you know, I thought if there was 5,000 people, that would be a major, major success considering the climate. Um, and, and the amount of attacks against this demonstration. Now, the demands of the demonstration, I think, were totally solid. I agree with them. I see. I don't think I saw a problem with any of the demands. There's a 10 point or eight, eight or 10 point list of demands. The criticism was not really overtly was not about the demands of the demonstration. Overtly was all about who was participating in the demonstration. And there are all kinds of people who call themselves leftists and, you know, uh, anarchists, anti-colonialists, socialists, Marxists, whatever, who have just spent incredible amounts of time attacking <laughs> this demonstration that that the demands themselves I don't really see you know how you oppose the demands now there clearly were a whole bunch of people that participated in this demonstration a whole bunch of people who were like you know some of the organizers and some of the speakers who I disagree with on a lot of issues and 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 not just disagree with I vehemently disagree with on a lot of issues. So it really was a, a bizarre uh, uh, kind of coming together of political ideologies. And I don't, to be honest, we fully understand how these different, these different, uh, uh, some of the right wing kind of forces where how they come to the sort of similar positions as the as the anti war anti imperialist movement. But nonetheless, they were, you know, protesting behind um, uh, a list of demands that, again, I think was was very, uh, um, you know, solid. But there were a lot of people on the left that spent incredible amount of time. Now, I can I can I get behind, OK, I don't want to go to this demonstration because I don't feel comfortable with these, you know, uh, libertarian, right wing, racist uh, forces that are, you know, part of this mobilization. I can understand that. Spending like a week or weeks even and like, you know, multiple, multiple tweets and comments attacking the the mobilization now that's I, I don't like how could you justify that um and it just I, there was one article about the mobilization i thought kind of like encapsulated it all which the title was anti-semite replaces pedophile at rally protesting aid to ukraine and this is really like this was reflective not just of like you know right-wing attack but of like left-wing su supposed left-wing criticism of this and they were like, these people are, they're, they're pedophiles, they're, they're anti-Semites. And of course, the main thing, they're, they're Putinists. And it's just like, the criticism was just like, these are bad people, essentially. Right? It came down to, I don't like these people. This is, these are just bad people getting together. This is, you know, it, it's like, you know, the pedophile, anti-Semite, Putinist. I don't really know what that, the connection is between those different ones, except again, that they are just a bunch of, uh, a bunch of baddies that you should have nothing uh, 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 to do with. Um, but again, this was the, this was left wing forces, and I think this is reflective of this person criticizing my tweet of of saying that that uh, that is amazing that people aren't paying attention to Canadian foreign policy who considers uh, consider themselves on the left. There are a lot of people who talk about no borders. I, I've written about this no borders media, right? These anar anarchist crowd all about no borders, and if you read their what they put on their Twitter. They only talk about Canada and the U.S., right? They're completely North American centric in their worldview, but they're all about like no borders, right? Um, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's fa it's it's a it's a it's a anarchist nationalism, and it's a uh, obedience to the dominant media political culture that you see reflected in in this type of uh, in this type of uh, 
uh, analysis or, or, or lack thereof of, of analysis. So uh, we are getting towards the one year anniversary of, uh, of Russia's brutal, uh, illegal uh, February 24th uh, full scale invasion of, uh, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, today is the ninth anniversary of the worst uh, day of the killing of the in, during the Maidan protests, and uh, where I think forty nine people were killed on this day. Now, still, um, it's it's not clear who who killed them. It, it looks uh, the evidence about it being the uh, Yanukovych's uh, uh, forces uh, seems to be hasn't held up and doesn't. They haven't, even though they've had nine years to prove it, they haven't been able, been able to. And the evidence does suggest that it was, in fact, uh, protesters uh, who did it, the, the anti-Yanukovych protesters who did it. That, of course, will not make it onto the big uh, week of, of uh, marking of this on CBC. I, I saw on the National last night, CBC National is going to be in Ukraine for the whole week uh on uh marking this this one year anniversary the uh murray brewster the the uh senior military uh, uh reporter will um is going to be there one of the people uh, on the ground they announced uh, yesterday and almost for sure they will just ignore all of the geopolitical context to this to this uh uh war and what provoked the war and and uh, again not justifying the brutality and the illegality of, of what uh, Russia's done, but there is a context, there is a provocation. Uh, there are policies that the Canadian government pursued knowingly, knowing that the likely or that a very, there was a solid chance that what we're seeing happen uh, uh, would transpire. And they did it because they don't care about uh, Ukrainians and, and, um, and, and that. Uh, I mentioned Murray Brewster partly because I did a piece, and I think I've mentioned it previously, but it, I think it's really worth mentioning, um, about just before the invasion a year ago about Murray Brewster. And he I basically made the point that you don't know, it's hard to know if journalists are just are psychophants of power or they're lazy or ignorant uh, sometimes. But in his case, it was clear that he was a psychophant of power because I said, I argued that if he just would have reported what he himself had previously reported, he would be offering his viewers and readers much better context of what was going on than what he was actually uh, reporting. So Murray Brewster is the reporter that, um, that, proved, that showed that there were uh, far right forces that were based at the Canadian embassy in Kyiv for more than a week. Um, during the protests, the Maidan protest and the ouster of Yanukovych. That's a very important piece of context of how Canada played a role, direct role in destabilizing the elected government, helping to oust the elected government. And a lot, a lot of the history we've seen playing out, you know, has its roots in some of those decisions. Murray Brewster's also reported about the 2008 NATO conference where the Harper government, the Bush administration, the US pushed for NATO expansion and the Incredible reaction that created within uh, within Moscow, uh, and Murray Bruce has also reported about the uh, uh, neo-Nazi forces that were in the Ukrainian military that Canada was training. So he reported about that all back in 2015 and 2008, and you know in previous years. But in the weeks before the Russian invasion, when that context was particularly politically sensitive and politically important for Canadians to know. He absolutely refused to mention any of that, knowing because the 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 ethos of the political the media kind of uh, uh, context was really the drum beats towards war, and that information that that he had previously reported would would undercut uh, the moralizing that the Canadian officials were were uh, uh, putting out. Um. Uh, today, Joe Biden, of course, I, I assume people have seen, was was in Kyiv, uh, further stamping that you know we're going, we're all in, we're going to keep going, sending more weapons, more uh, more militarism, further ramping up the escalatory uh, dynamic. Le Devoir reported on Friday they 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 uh, they calculated all the Canadian arms shipments to uh, Ukraine this year. 
uh, and they came up with it that it's $2.26 billion in arms shipments that Canada has provided to Ukraine. So that's bigger. That's substantially bigger. I was saying uh, that you hear out there just over a billion. I, I, I had, I was pretty sure it was over 1.5 billion. I've been saying 1.5 billion, but Le Devoir is saying it's, it's 2.26 billion. And uh, that includes, uh, according to Le Devoir, four heavy tanks and gun shells, 4,200 single-use rocket launchers, an anti-aircraft missile system, four howitzers and 27,000 shells, many, many small arms and munitions, 76 drone cameras, 246 arm or 247 armored vehicles, and uh, quite, quite a, a, an amount of, of weaponry. Now, when I posted this to Twitter, that uh, Thomas Juno, who I mentioned previously, who you know was all about Nor, we have to pump in more money to NORAD uh, because the balloons were coming after us. Uh, the the he posted how great this was, and yes, you know we should be giving more of this weaponry to Ukraine. It's a it's a down payment on democracy or whatever, whatever. And uh, and so I pointed out. Uh, which he didn't respond to me. I asked him why he, you know, why where is he on calling for weapons to the Palestinians? Where is he on weapons to the Congolese to fight the Rwandan invasion that's going on? Uh, where is he on calling for weapons to the Houthis uh, to fight the Saudi invasion? And a fraction, we gave a fraction of the weapon we, we've given to Ukraine over the past uh, year to to uh, those forces. It would do a lot more to end the violence. In the case of Congo, it would definitely stop Rwanda's invasion. Uh, even without giving weapons, I think if we just did, we cut off aid to Rwanda and launched a big diplomatic effort to end Rwandan violence in, in Congo, that would probably be enough to stop the violence. Um, obviously, with regards to the Saudis, we know we, 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 give, we sell them weapons, let alone you know, giving weapons to their adversaries. Um, and of course, for the Palestinians, if we were to, you know, get at all serious about, uh, you know, if we just started cutting off the uh, all the public support we give to the Israeli military and all these Israeli organizations, that would uh, go some way in 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 blunting Israel's uh, willingness and ability to uh, to kill uh, uh, to kill Palestinians. Um, so of course, but you don't hear anything about this these sort of big comments of let's push weapons to the to the Palestinians uh, or others from uh, from people like Thomas Juno and the other uh, militarists in this country. Um, today, uh, earlier today, I uh, I um, I. Uh, I, uh, let's see where we are. Oh, yeah. Okay. As we mark the one year anniversary of the horror in Ukraine, do you, do you want, do you want to apologize for your role in promoting NATO expansion? and opposing the Minsk Peace Accord? Do you want to apologize for your role when you were foreign minister in opposing the Minsk Peace Accord and prom promoting NATO expansion? Now your government, now your government is fueling the war, 2.26 billion in weapons over, over, the, over this year, 2.26 billion. You apologize, you apologize. You want, you want, you want to apologize. Yeah, you apologize for your role in, in promoting expansion of NATO and opposing the Minsk Peace Accord. Oppose your, your government is pushing more conflict. Why not negotiation? Why don't you push for negotiation? Why do you want more horror? You want every Ukrainian to die? As we mark the one year anniversary of the horror in Ukraine, you want. So that was uh, that was uh, Francois Philippe uh, uh, Champagne, uh, who was the former Canadian foreign minister, who pushed uh, NATO, you pushed Ukraine joining NATO and um, pushed the Operation Unifier, and which is you know Canada's military training that undermined the Minsk Accords and never said anything about 
pushing uh, 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 forward the mince piece, mince two piece accord. Um, so I interrupted his uh, his speech uh, uh, today at a at a, a press event. Um, and so, yeah, just before we get into questions, uh, I think people should, um, uh, there's, uh, there are a week of actions this week, uh, 23rd to 26th. Here in Montreal, there's a demonstration on the 25th uh, against NATO, against Russia's invasion. And, uh, and in different cities, there's different actions. I saw one in Ottawa on the 23rd. I think there's a rally at the U.S. Uh, embassy there. And uh, so people should uh, should try to come out to those if you can. Uh, also, I just want to make a final thing is that I was uh, I was thinking of trying to to turn this into a podcast, and I wanted to know if there's anyone out there who has a podcasting uh, experience and would be maybe interested in uh, helping. I don't know, take the lead in in um, turning this into a week like a podcast weekly. I thought I would get in touch with some of the left wing podcast that Har Harbinger uh, podcasting uh, network and uh, a Spotify. I don't, I don't know the world of podcasts, but if there's somebody who does know that world and was, would be into maybe uh, helping with that and, or uh, I guess editing it or, or to the extent it needs to be edited to be put on a podcast, uh, please do uh, uh, get in touch. And uh, if anyone has uh, comments or uh, questions, go ahead. I, I, uh, I have to, I have to now unmute everyone because uh I have added protections here. So uh, uh, I think I see Laura first. So go ahead, Laura. Well, hi, Eve. Sorry, I can't help you with the podcasting. I don't know how to do it. But wouldn't your good friend Aaron Maté, uh, as his pushback is both in po podcast form and YouTube form, um, I bet he could tell you or set you up with somebody. Um, I just want to tell you that I drove up from North Carolina to the Rage Rally. I was there and um, I would say there were two to 3,000 people there. And I actually thought, I mean, it was disappointing it was that small, but I actually thought it was a successful rally. You know, I had, before going, I had some fear that I might find myself standing next to people with signs on other issues that I would hate, either anti-China, anti-immigrant or what. And, and there was none of that. I thought it was very respectful. And most of the speakers stayed on message. It was really about war. I mean, a few like Ron Paul went off against the Fed and paying taxes and all that stuff. But but I thought mostly people really were on message and I thought it was really respectful on that. But it brought something up to me because, as you know, a number of people and organizations were endorsers and speakers pulled out of it. And unfortunately, I seem to have connections to all of them. And um, it was disappointing to me because it was all people on the left that had pulled out. And it made me wonder, you know, about us, because I, I, I mean, I'm sure that to people on the right, many of our views and the views of many of the speakers like Max Blumenthal and Dennis Kuznich, that they would hate them, but they didn't use that as an excuse to pull out of a rally with us. You know, they kept their eyes on the prize of this was an anti-war rally. And so, uh, you know, I felt it was, uh, it's unfortunate that the left has this thing where you have to be with them on all issues or, or, or we can't, can't be around you. Um, but my feeling was it was a successful rally, just uh, too small. I don't know what more will come of it. Uh, you know, the problems with the rally before make me think that maybe the potential for left or right uh, sort of coming together might be quite limited. But I did want to ask you what you think about that in Canada. Do you see any uh, instances of left and right on foreign policy coming together to work together at all? Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, uh, I think I may have said this in last week. I don't, I have never had really that experience in, a, in, a, in terms of organizing uh, overt way, like the Echec à la Guerre uh, demonstration here on, uh, on the 25th. Um, I mean, I, I, there may be what, I, I don't know. I just kind of, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't imagine there would be many right-wing uh, forces that would come out for that. Now, lots of demonstrations in, um, in Quebec and Montreal have the, the, the flag of the uh, les patriotes, which <laughs> has left, left and right kind of connotations with it, and that's a can be a little bit of a complicated one. Um, but uh, yeah, my experience is mostly that it's been the the uh, the groups uh, that I've you know organized with, like it's it's sort of mostly left wing coalitions. Sometimes you know, like the Sheikh la Guerre has like church groups that I'm not sure that are always uh, on board with uh, on some of the social issues. And I would, you know, I think there would be um, 
you know, some of the, some of the, uh, um, I don't know, maybe some of the, you know, uh, community groups or, you know, um, racialized or ethnic, if you like, community groups that, that I've uh, been involved in organizing that they may have issues, may have perspectives on some of the social issues that I wouldn't, I wouldn't agree with. Uh, but it's never really sort of come up in a kind of formalized left, right. I mean, that really was a pretty uh, odd or unique, depending on how you want to frame it, uh, kind of left, right, kind of coming together. Um, I'm just, I'm just stunned by how, how like all consuming these people criticizing it were with like, they would, they would, they would claim that they didn't have a problem with the, the the substance of the demonstration, and then they would just like it was people who were like you know tweeted like oh, dozens yeah. and dozens and dozens of times <laughs> attacking uh, the demonstration, and like I said, it would attack it from like every different direction. It was just like there there was a speaker who was supposed to be a pedophile, then there was the anti semite, and then there was the the this, and then there was the Putin, and then there was this, and like it was like just they're all baddies. That was really what it came back came down to, which. It, it it reflects the fact that that they don't they're on board with the NATO proxy war, they're on board with with uh, you know the broad outlines of Canadian foreign policy. They're on board with the empire. They there there's there are people who are uh, and I, this is also something I find quite quite interesting. These people who are like all whipped up about the fascists and the fascists are on the cusp and. Well, we have a Democrat and a liberal in office, okay? In the US, you got a Democrat. In Canada, you have a liberal, right? And the idea that the, like, the neo-Nazis and the fascists are on the cusp of power and that that's who we have to spend our time like concerned about while it's a liberal prime minister that's increasing Canada's greenhouse gas emissions and pushing war and imperialism around the world. In the US, it's a Democrat. I mean, while Trump was in office, you could at least kind of make that argument, right? I didn't, I didn't agree with it. I thought that was wildly exaggerated in terms of what our real principal concern was uh, and who had power and where the power relations and who was really destroying the world and stuff like that. But, but now when you have a liberal and a Democrat in the US, how can you possibly be like making that argument that this is the, this is the sort of like, you know, principal fight that, the, that left-wing people have to be engaged in? It, it just, it, it, you know, effectively it runs cover for Justin Trudeau, right? I mean, that's effectively how a lot of this, you know, uh, kind of politics ends up being like a pro-liberal party uh, uh, kind of politic. But, um, but, you know, the sad thing Eve, is that a lot of people attacking are people that we agree with on foreign policy, people like a Black Agenda report and like worldwide, whatever it is, socialist, who I've been on anti-war rallies with, and just coming out and just attacking the rally in really vitriolic ways as being like so white. So anyway, I know I just, anyway, it was disheartening to see, and it did cause me to think a little bit about the left and why are we so, you know, it's not broadly the left, but I would say the people at the demonstration were, they, I would, if I were to bet, I would say there were far more on the right and, you know, libertarians than there were leftists there, but that's, my own perspective on it, what I thought I saw, but yeah, anyway. I, yeah, I saw I saw the Black Agenda Report article. Uh, I didn't, I, I don't, I didn't follow it that closely, but my my, I saw there was an article critical of it. Again, I don't, I don't even have like it's it's the it, you know one article critical. I'm like that. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's you know interesting. Yeah. It's when you started like spending like this was like the most important political thing you could do for the next two weeks was like attacking this <laughs> this this demonstration. That to me, yeah. like, if you don't want to go and if you think it's like really dangerous that, that it, you know, you think it's dangerous that, that lefties and, and right wing forces come together on this one issue, you know, state your piece and I'm not going to it, that I can kind of get behind. Mm -hmm. But then when you get to the point of like, you're just, you want to destroy it, you want to like, yeah. that to me is just, I don't know, you, you come across as, as a an agent of empire. I mean, <laughs> yeah, and they were on Twitter. I mean, I mean, there were a lot of different people from these different groups that were doing that. And that's what bothered me too. I thought, just don't go, but why would you kill something that's an anti war protest? Anyway, that's all I'll say. Yeah. Oh.
Uh, I'm not seeing uh, anyone else. No, Jake uh, Javins here. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Oh, how am I going to do this with Jake? Uh, I have to undo. Uh, let's see. Yeah, well, um, let's see. okay. Yes. Uh, I think you can go. Can you go ahead, Jake? Yes. Go ahead, Jake. Fine. I just wanted to mention that most likely you and all attendees or most attendees, they saw that uh, piece of news that uh, last week there was a conference in Africa with many African countries. They had a conference and a delegation from Israel, which looks like they were allowed to go there, participate. But the last minute before the proceeding started, they said, we don't want to do anything with Israel and ask the security guard to throw them out. And they did. And of course, Israel got very angry and now they want to retaliate against the African countries and so on. I don't know if it has really much importance or not, but uh, just thought I'll mention it and see if you have anything to say. Yeah, I saw that. I, 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 don't, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think it's obviously uh, small bits of uh, resistance to normalizing uh, uh, the apartheid regime is a you know is a good thing. Um, uh, I don't know you know what the broader ramifications uh, uh, will be, but uh, but yeah, I think it's um, you know a good uh, small uh, small kind of uh, rejection of uh, anti-Palestinian policies. Thank you. Well, if there's no one else, uh, it's already uh, past seven o'clock. So uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, same place, same time uh, next week. Take care. Have a good night.